coming up on the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. Well, we talk about the seven central mechanisms, but the very first one is the gut. That is the biggest one. And then the second is the stress hormone cortisol. The mm -hmm. third are these hidden sneaky infections. The fourth is food sensitivities. And just like infections, foods can bug you. Obviously, hey, I got a fever. I eat a food. It makes me sick every time I do it. They got sneaky way foods can bug us, just like sneaky infections. And then vitamin deficiencies. And then hormone deficiencies or imbalances. So even though we talk a lot about testosterone, it's coming from these other things. And then the last is environmental toxicity. All the toxins in our world, they're just making it so challenging to stay healthy. But the gut is number one. Hello, and welcome to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I'm Brian Grin, and I'm here to give you actionable tips to get your body back to what it once was 5, 10, even 15 years ago. Each week, I'll give you an in-depth interview with a health expert from around the world to cut through the fluff and get you long-term sustainable results. This week, I interviewed functional medicine practitioner, Dr. David Bilstrom. We discussed how functional medicine aims to understand the root causes of chronic health issues, along with the role of the immune system in autoimmune diseases and the importance of addressing the gut as a central mechanism for overall health. We also discussed the impact of vitamin D deficiency. Lastly, we touched on epigenetics and protein folding in optimizing health and reversing chronic conditions. Really enjoyed my interview with Dr. David Bilstrom. I know you will too. Thanks so much for listening and enjoy the show. All right. Welcome to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. My name is Brian Grin, and I have Dr. David Bilstrom on. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Brian. Thanks for coming on. And uh, all the way from Idaho. I no. meant to ask you, what, what year did you move there? I know you said you were in Chicago for a number of years. We've been here almost nine years now. Excellent. Did you say the people big... on your podcast know where Idaho is? When we were telling <laughs> friends in Chicago we were moving to Idaho, most of them, you mean Iowa? I don't know if most people know where that is, but that's probably not a bad thing though, right? Well, that, that's right. We're, we're at, uh, to give people a perspective, we're about an hour and 15 minutes west of Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Okay. So a lot of good skiing. Yeah, and and now you're spending your days uh, mainly treating individuals and and helping people with functional medicine, correct? Correct. And you've been doing that for what thirty years? Well, I started out as a rehabilitation physician, uh, and, and my sp my specialty area was uh, spinal cord injury. So everybody that I saw was paralyzed from the waist down or the neck down, and it's a very challenging population. But also, it really taught me of these gaps in our ability to treat people with chronic health issues. You just can't treat everything with a medication or a surgery. And then I've been on about a 30-year quest to learn about other options, including all the things I did learn in kind of my traditional training. And so uh, now for about 20 years, uh, I've kind of moved into functional medicine, which answers the question, tries to answer the question, why somebody has what they have. Rather than just putting a bandage on a symptom, we can figure out why you have what you have. And when we know why, we're always in a position to reverse it. Or because we know why people get chronic health issues of all kinds, we're in a position to prevent it as well. And what sort of drove you to this area of the market? Um, obviously, alternative health is a growing market. So I could totally understand why. It's something obviously I'm in as well. Uh, was there a certain um, a patient that led you down that road or just an interest of yours to go down this road? Well, the first thing was that uh, I was looking for something to help that patient population, and they're so sensitive to medications. I'm like, wow, wouldn't it be great if there was something out there that could help these folks and didn't have any side effects? And acupuncture kept popping up. And so I said, okay, well, I'm going to train in acupuncture. So I went to UCLA, trained in medical acupuncture, came back looking for, give me an easy tennis elbow to take care of. Uh, but because of where I was at with all my partners, uh, rehab partners in this huge rehab uh, facility in North Carolina, uh, we're always the ones that get sent kind of the people that nobody else can take care of. Kind of the, and, But then if we can't take care of them, we have no other options. And so I came back and my partners were all like, hot dog, we got another option. So I got like the most complicated of all the complicated people. And oh my gosh, did it work great. And I'm like, holy mm. cow, this stuff works so much better than I thought. What else is out there that I don't know? And then I got into integrated medicine, and I was running an integrated medicine clinic in Hinsdale, Illinois, west of Chicago. And functional medicine started coming into the forefront here where you're answering why. 
Now, with acupuncture, if you get at the central mechanism that's causing somebody's issues, you're in a position to fix everything at the same time. You just don't do the same treatment. So 10 people come in with low back pain. You don't do 10 treatments the same because one person has low back. is their main issue, but they got asthma, low back, irritable bowel, low back and brain fog, low back and migraine. So they're all different. You got to treat them differently. But you get the central mechanism, everything's getting better. And then with functional medicine, I go, oh, my gosh, this is the same thing. You're answering why the central mechanism, and you're not only in a position to reverse anything, basically, but reversing everything at the same time. And when you do an acupuncture, it's very much kind of a leap of faith. Like, you're coming in to see me. You're not sure what acupuncture does. How does it work? Does it even work? I know it's been around thousands of years, so probably it works. Otherwise, it wouldn't be still around. Right. But somebody's going to put needles in me. It's a leap of faith. So you come into me with functional medicine, and I say, okay, we should be able to figure this out. But well, what are you going to do? I'm going to run some blood tests. I'm going to run some tests. And they go, oh, that kind of sounds like the medicine I'm used to. Because if I go see another practitioner, they say, well, let's run some tests and see what's going on here. What just happens at the functional medicine test, it's like cheating because we know where this stuff comes from. The typical tests that get run once a year for people, you pretty much have to be dead before anything shows up in those the things. They're not looking in the right place. Or they might look at something that's the right thing to look for, but then the interpretation of the lab results is very important as well. So it could be missed. So we know where this stuff comes from. The science is really clear why people get health issues, including why people get these health issues that are so much more common than they used to be, all what they call the civilization diseases. So things that are happening so much more now than they than used to be. And you go like, well, geez, you know, like in men's health, it's like, wow, it seems like everybody has testosterone issues. Oh my gosh, erectile dysfunction? You know, we're, men should be able to get erections with a, when a, bree a breeze blows, you know, kind of a thing, <laughs> right? Because we're on this earth to procreate, pass out our genes. And if you can't do that, you're just like, why are you even here? They're like, well, everybody has those issues. Oh my gosh, cholesterol, high blood pressure, cancer, like prostate cancer. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, heart attacks, strokes, Alzheimer's, dementia, Lou Gehrig's disease, memory, brain fog. It's like, oh my gosh, everybody and their brother has this stuff. Well, there's reasons why our world is creating these things. We know, but we know what tests to run to figure it out for people. And when we move from our private practice out here, what got me, because we were seeing people with a lot of autoimmune disease, a lot of chronic disease, and doing things that other people weren't necessarily doing. So we were already seeing people from not just the Midwest, but all up and down the East Coast, Florida, New York. And I read this article, a heartbreaking article in the New York Times about this uh, female journalist who was losing her career and her life to lupus, which is an autoimmune disease where the immune system becomes confused and attacks our own body parts. And it was so sad. I've heard that story a thousand times. We reversed that stuff, but she couldn't find anybody to do that. I'm like, okay somebody's got to change the way autoimmune disease is dealt with worldwide and it might as well be me. So to do that back then, we said, well, we got to tap into the global medical tourism where people are willing to travel to places to get care they can't get close to home. And so looked all across the U.S., where do people travel to? So I plotted out specific areas. And out here, even though Idaho is like, there's like 50,000 people when we first moved out here in this entire region. But everybody comes here for Jackson Hole, Wyoming, Big Sky, Montana, Sun Valley, which is two hours west, Salt Lake City, two hours and a half south, and the Snake River coming down. Everybody comes here to fly fish. Yellowstone is an hour and a half away. And so before COVID, people have to travel to see us the first visit, and then once a year, and then we can do telephone stuff the entire time. But then when COVID hit, so like even like the week before COVID hit, we had like five new people come down from Alaska to see us. People were traveling already to see us from all over the place. But then with COVID, we can do everything telehealth. And so now we see people from every state in the country and spanning 21 time zones around the world because there's just not people doing this. Our goal is to get this, is ideally get a practitioner in every community that knows how to do this. But in the meantime, we're here for people with these chronic health issues that nobody else can help them with. And you sort of 
you hear autoimmune thrown out a lot, almost like a blanket statement. Uh, what would what's your best way of explaining autoimmune autoimmune disease, and why does it continually come up? And it's one of the civilization diseases. You see it so much more than you used to. Um, so there's two parts of the immune system. So one part is called the adaptive immune system, where your uh, immune system makes antibodies, specific antibodies against specific things, ideally against things that are not us that are going to hurt us, like an infection that gets in. It's not us. It's going to hurt us. To make antibodies against that particular infection, kill it, get it out. Um, or cancer cells, they become our cell to a cancer cell. They're not us anymore. They're just going to hurt us. The immune system attacks it, gets rid of it. The other part of the immune system is called uh, the innate immune system as involved in controlling inflammation. And if you have excessive inflammation in any body part, that body part is where your health issue is. And so you get the body basically attacking itself with antibodies, autoimmune diseases, antibodies attacking around body parts. We're basically self-destructing. When that happens, never a good idea to self-destruct. No. So we now know, when we moved out here, we didn't know this, but oh my gosh, the explosion in the scientific literature, we now know that the immune system is connected to every chronic health issue, not just the classic ones like rheumatoid arthritis. Oh, you're attacking your own joints. Or multiple sclerosis. Oh, you're attacking your brain. But it's involved in heart attacks, strokes, cancer, osteoporosis. 10% of people that get osteoporosis now are guys. Breast cancer. 10% of people that get breast cancer are guys. It's involved in all cancers, but also everything you can imagine. It's this immune system is part of everything. And so fortuitously, we're kind of the ones that know some of this more than a lot of other people. And so we're in a position, even like cardiovascular disease, like heart attacks and stroke risk, you kind of used to think of it as sort of this inevitable result of living long enough to get into that range. But we now know it's an immune system issue. Infections, every chronic health issue has infection, just the sneaky ones. So not the ones that give you fevers, but the ones that drive inflammation and inability to clear inflammation. And so that goes with cardiovascular stuff, including and it got testosterone levels in guys. And this is part of this whole process where historically a guy would get into their 70s and they start to slowly drop in testosterone production. Okay, you want to be 800 to 1100 as a guy. Well, if you're in your 70s, you might kind of slip down towards 600. But that's okay. Now it's still really good. We are now seeing 20 year olds, 18 year olds who should have the best testosterone of their entire life under 200. And you're like, so this is where. Guys that used to get heart attacks were in their 70s, in their 50s. Now guys are having heart attacks in their 20s. And it's not the guys that you might look at. It's like, you know, there's Bob down the street. He, he, he works out three hours a day, eats so healthy. Well, Bob just died at age 35 running on his treadmill. Massive heart attack. But you also see these guys like high school boys. Ideally, as a high school boy, you should be able to eat like 10 meals a day sit on the couch all day and still have six-pack abs. So you see the high school basketball players with their tight basketball tops, they got a tire around them. That's never supposed to happen. Inability to make testosterone and then gut health uh, are driving this kind of amazing chronic disease explosion. I know it's probably tough to pinpoint one thing, uh, but if you were going to sort of try to do that regarding uh, sort of this autoimmune epidemic that's going on, uh, what would you, what would you, you know, what would you point to? Well, we talk about the seven central mechanisms, but the very first one is the gut. That is the biggest one, and then the second is the stress hormone cortisol. The mm -hmm. third are these hidden sneaky infections. The fourth is food sensitivities, and just like infections. Foods can bug you, obviously. Hey, I got a fever. I eat a food. It makes me sick every time I do it. They got sneaky way foods can bug us, just like sneaky infections. And then vitamin deficiencies and then hormone deficiencies or imbalances. So even though we talk a lot about testosterone, it's coming from these other things. And then the last is environmental toxicity. All the toxins in our world, they're just making it so challenging to stay healthy. But the gut is number one. The gut, yeah. I, I had a feeling you were going to say that. And then you mentioned cortisol as well. Uh, 
how do you what type of tests do you run for your clients? I actually recently just uh, graduated from uh, FDN. I don't know if you're familiar with FDN. That's they do it. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it took a little while, but um, and so they do a different tests. They have about five different lab tests. They 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 sort of lean on uh, one of them is like cortisol and DHEA is a big one. That sort of ratio, um, estradiol, progesterone, testosterone. Um, the interesting thing about the cortisol is it sort of has this diurnal rhythm, right? Where in the morning, obviously it should rise up and then it should sort of peak uh, or sort of taper off as the day goes on. And a lot of times with people, you don't see that. Um, are those the type of lab tests that you're running with individuals? Yeah. So the, so the blood test we run uh, can be run in any lab. It's not like you have to mail them out. And so we look for a couple different vitamin deficiencies, including one that's very important for guys called red blood cell zinc. Zinc's very hard to get into the cells. And so if you run a serum in your bloodstream, zinc, that doesn't really matter much. But the question is, can the zinc get into the cells? Red blood cells, for example, we can test that. And low red blood cell zinc, not serum zinc, low red blood cell zinc has been correlated with guys' inability to make testosterone. We check uh, ferritin, which is iron stores. High ferritin, iron stores, are running too high, create tons of inflammation in the body, gut, brain, all this. But also in guys, excess ferritin tends to accumulate in guys' testicles. And when that happens, you can't make testosterone. So we kind of jokingly tell the guys when that happens, oh, this is rusty nuts. Rule of thumb, never let your nuts get rusty and because you can't make testosterone. And then we'll check the hormones, kind of like you're talking about. Probably I'd probably check a few other ones. We always check for these infections that drive chronic disease. Simple blood tests, anybody can run them. And um, that gives us a really good picture, including, and then we'll run like digestive stool analysis. The gut's a central mechanism. It's a poop test. You do, you mail it off. It gives us fantastic inflama- information. Then what, what that will tell us is what's creating stress. What is throwing off that stress hormone? Because when you look at the stress hormone cortisol, the body's fight or flight mode, life or death mode stress response is designed for intermittent stress, which is usually emotional stress. It is not designed for 24 hour a day, seven day a week, month after month, physical stress. So if you have a vitamin deficiency, a hormone deficiency or an imbalance, a problem in your gut, that is a 24 hour a day, seven day a week. It kicks cortisol up and locks it in place. And then when you're stuck in the stress mode, you might feel stressed. Oh, you know, I hold my shoulders up. I find I grind my teeth, you know, that kind of stuff. I'm biting my fingernails, picking at my cuticles. You know cortisol stuck. But what we need to answer is why the cortisol got stuck. And it might not be showing up in the traditional ways. It's just showing up as, well, I can't fix anything. Nobody heals, fixes things well in the stress mode. Well, why am I getting this, 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 and this? That's weird because I'm, I'm not like 147. I'm only 47, right? Mm-hmm. And you go, okay, so cortisol is stuck to the point where we don't check saliva cortisol nearly as much as we used to because if we say well we should be able to figure out why physically you got stuck in the stress mode and if we address the why's seven central mechanisms for example cortisol just resets itself and in guys we tend to think a lot about well erections ability to maintain an erection or even a sex drive is all testosterone but so often it's cortisol and and how i explain this to guys but the same thing kind of goes with women is when you're stuck in the stress mode, your body feels like it's in the life or death mode, like you're running from a bear. Now, truly out here, we got to carry bear spray. When I go back country, <laughs> yeah, you might really have to run into that. I got to no. carry bear spray. When we go hiking, you got to carry bear spray. Um, have you run into one? Bear. Have you run into one? An early season spring hike uh, last year, we heard a big growl. Okay. We were kind of when the snow was just starting to melt, but it hadn't melted, but we were going early. The bears hadn't gone up. They were just coming out of hibernation. Scared the living the mm. Jesus out of Jody, my wife and I. We just hightailed it back down. Holy cow. We've never gone downhill <laughs> as fast. <laughs> you, yeah, uh, that is a... Yeah, okay. And so Anyways, for, just, cur- just curious. Yeah. Yeah. So you can imagine. Okay, so I'm right. running downhill, right? Scared to be Jesus. I'm worried this bear's chasing me. Well, if a bear's chasing you, you're stuck in the stress mode, you're not going to go Hey, bear, give me a second. I want to have sex. I'm thinking about sex. 
Right, like, hey, bear, right. Give me a second. I got to get an erection. It's like, oh, no, if I get away from this bear chasing me, then I might think about having sex. Maybe I'll get my sex drive back. Hey, I might be able to get an erection if I'm not running from a bear. So for guys, sex drive, erection, retaining erection, oftentimes there's more of this cortisol getting stuck than is even the testosterone deficiency. What about uh, vitamin D? That's a big one. I was actually just in Florida and uh, I have my vitamin D is probably a little bit on the low side, I'd say, uh, being in Chicago here in the winter. Uh, but you know, going to Florida for a, uh, a week, it's amazing the difference and how much you feel, how much better you feel when you get a little sun. Um, what do you see that as a driver of a lot of disease? And, um, yeah. And to your point, it's so hard for humans to make vitamin D from sun exposure nowadays that most people are totally tanked unless you're on the right dose of supplementation, totally tanked. And so ideally on a blood test, a person's vitamin D level should be 70 to 90 lifeguards in San Diego, mid forties. They're like 40 points long. They should be. Now, when your vitamin D is low enough, if you go someplace sunny, it'll come up a bit. And even that little bit can make you go, oh, my gosh, that's great. Well, imagine if you were perfect, how great you feel. Now, mm. so everybody needs a great vitamin D, super important. But back in 2018, this information started coming out that we're like, oh, my gosh, you can have all the vitamin D in the world and still not get a bang for your effort because every cell in your body has receptors for vitamin D, all vitamin D receptors just like every cell in your body has insulin receptors. So that insulin from your pancreas can attach, tell the cell what to do, blood sugar control is excellent. Well, it turns out insulin receptors can become resistant. You can't attach and do the work. You get diabetes, elevated blood sugar. Well, these vitamin D receptors become resistant too. And it turns out there are more vitamin D receptors in the gut than any other body part. And when the scientists found that, they go, oh my gosh, Vitamin D must be so important for the gut, but the receptors become resistant. Oh my gosh, is this a central mechanism? So what they found initially was that, well, if you fix this vitamin D receptor resistance in the gut, you can turn around autoimmune disease of the gut. You can turn around ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, recurrent infections like H. pylori and C. diff. But they also said, oh my gosh, this looks like exactly what you want to do for everything prevent cancer, prevent heart attacks and strokes and brain stuff and all kinds of stuff. And then all the data that came out subsequently was like, oh, yeah, six months later, the same researchers actually at U- uh, University of Illinois, Chicago, one of the University of Illinois med school graduates, I got to give a shout out to these researchers. Oh, my gosh, are they doing some cool stuff? Six months later, they go, oh, my gosh, this is a central mechanism. I'm sorry, a nuclear weapon against metabolic disease, insulin and blood sugar, abnormal weight gain, heart attack and stroke risk. Elevated cholesterol, nuclear weapon. Harvard Journal of Psychiatry two years ago says, oh my gosh, if you can shift the intestinal microbiome this way, because it's fixing the gut, you can treat major depressive disorder. Another journal comes out and says, if you can shift the intestinal microbiome this way, people's personalities change. They become more outgoing and more social. So to fix this vitamin D receptor resistance, is a super central mechanism, and but they also told us how to do that. And this with a triad, we call it the foundational triad: daily vitamin D, daily probiotic, and daily butyrate. Butyrate is this really important short chain fatty acid made by the good bacteria in the gut. But the good bacteria in the gut gets dinged so easily nowadays. Stress, antibiotics, Motrin's and Advil's, and metformin, the blood sugar medicine, all these kind of things that. That triad fixes the vitamin D receptor resistance, central mechanism for all this stuff. So that's where we talk a lot about the gut, is this vitamin D receptor issue. And regarding the gut, like you mentioned before, you send out a um, sort of a microbiome mapping, like uh, obviously send poop in and they get back uh, whatever pathogens or fungi or yeast that could be problematic. Yep. The chronic infections, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting because that's something that we did as well. Um, I think that is the future, don't you think? I feel like there's still a lot of research to be done in that area. This is sort of microbiome mapping and figuring out like, you know, where everyone's at as far as pathogens or, or yeast or zonulin's a big one. Um, mm-hmm. And I really do think that there's going to be more and more technology uh, regarding that, that sort of area. Yeah, the more, the more data we have, the, the better decision-making processes we have. 
though what we tend to find is, so, so on that test, it'll give us good bacteria, bad bacteria, mold, candida yeast. It tells us if the pancreas is making enough enzymes to digest your food. Uh, do you have some fat malabsorption or carbohydrate or protein malabsorption? It gives us its inflammation markers. It tells us four different short chain fatty acids like the butyrate. And it gives us like uh, uh, SIG A and zonulin yeah. to kind of tell us whether you've got this leaky gut. Now, in the big picture, if you've got these, these things going on, or because of our world, pretty much everybody's got a leaky gut. And so, what you want to do is you want to be able to go, okay, what infections do you have? Let's get rid of them. Now, there's one particular thing we like to use because everybody's got infections. It's always a mix. Just viruses, bacteria, candida, could be parasites, can be other things. One called mycoplasma is a super common one. So we all, you always have to use a really good broad spectrum antimicrobial that'll kill any infection, no matter where it's at in the body, gut, outside the body, gut, brain, joints. Even if you don't know what infections you're dealing with, you got to get rid of them. And then you got to fix this vitamin D receptor resistance because what happens when the vitamin D receptor resistance is cleared, good bacterial numbers go up, bad guys come down. You, you, you optimize that intestinal microbiome, which is such an important factor. The lining of the gut stops making inflammation. And this is where the gut becomes this engine of inflammation because it gets so disturbed. The lining actually makes chemicals that create more inflammation. And then when you fix the vitamin D receptor, the lining of the gut starts making these things called AMPs, antimicrobial peptides, to keep the bad bugs down, infections away long term. And then by doing that, you fix the leaky gut, you fix the intestinal microbiome, 80% of the immune system surrounds the gut, so you, now you fix the immune system that's involved in everything, and you get rid of all the stuff outside of the gut, such as nuclear weapon against metabolic syndrome, treat major depressive disorder, personality stuff, but also this is what you want to do to prevent all cancers, depression, anxiety, heart attacks and strokes, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, dementia, abnormal weight gain, all this stuff. Super central mechanism. You know, typically someone goes to their general practitioner. I don't really, and they don't really run these tests, <laughs> right? Like right. I, I, I have a general practitioner that I recently, I haven't gone to one in a while and then I just needed to get some things signed off. So I, I found one in the area and I asked him to do like a full blood panel. And he's like, well, I can only do these, this, this, and this, because that's what insurance covers. Um, and so I just sort of went on my own now and just did my own panel and paid for it out of pocket. Um, I feel like this is where sort of, uh, sort of the healthcare system maybe just falls short, right? Like it's, there, there's not this comprehensive, there can be, but it has to be like for him to do more testing, there has to be some type of reason where I just want to be proactive. <laughs> and so, um, that's where you come in. And even my, myself, you know, with the testing that we do through FDN is, is sort of getting ahead of the curve and finding out. You know what's sort of under underneath the hood, and what's really causing these issues? Yeah, and, and so you, your your practitioner is correct. You have to use the right diagnostic codes to justify any test, so whether it's a blood test or a CT scan or this. The problem is they just don't know what codes to use. And so when we order the panels we do that are quite extensive, we just know the codes to use, and insurance covers them. You just got to mm -hmm. know the right codes. And this is where, like in my book that I wrote. Not only do we talk about what tests are, or, or we talk about why people get these things, exactly what tests to run, exactly how to interpret the data. You can have the information you need, but you miss with the poor interpretation. Exactly what to do, like supplements, exactly when to retest, exactly what to do if you're not getting better, or, you know, how to tweak things. But we also say, well, these are the codes to use to justify the blood test so it's covered by insurance. It's not hard. You just got, and, and the insurance companies kind of keep tweaking things. So we have to kind of keep tweaking the codes. They'll go like, well, they, that code doesn't cover anymore. It's okay. We'll figure out another code. And that's why we always update uh, uh, so that people know what code will actually cover this stuff. So insurance is covering these tests that you're sending out. I feel very strongly this is something that should be covered through the insurance world. Um, that's why I've, I've never worked outside of the insurance model. But I really feel hmm. like this should be something that should be covered for everybody and through the insurance model. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I didn't realize some of these tests um, 
could be covered by insurance, which is that's 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 like good. All the hormone uh, tests that you you re- refer to, we run a couple of additional ones, like an estrone, which is the bad estrogen, on top of the estradiol. Is there's one code that covers all the hormone issues. So you go, oh, that makes it easy. We don't need a code for every one. It's like, well, here's a code that runs all the hormones. Yeah. What would you say? Maybe a case or two that. Uh, it comes to mind where someone had a certain condition and and you guys worked them out of it. I'm you know I'm sure people like to hear different stories that that sort yeah. of. So uh, you know, with, with your population uh, of men, is we often get guys coming where they're they're tired, their their brain is fogged. They've been gaining weight. They're really losing their mojo and their motivation, and they got some cholesterol issues and some blood sugar issues, of course, and. You know, they got some blood pressure issues. And so all these things are kind of going. And maybe they're only like 35, 45, you know, that kind of stuff. And the wife comes in with them. And we have them fill stuff out. One of the questions we ask is irritability and fatigue and memory concentration. Well, irritability is like a zero to 10. And on their form, I say, okay, so irritability, you rated it a two. And the wife looks at him like, a two? You got to be kidding me. You're such a grumpy old man. You're an eight if you're if you're a you know if anything. And he looks at him like, really? He goes, oh my gosh, you know, you're so irritable. Oh my gosh, you're snapping all the time. And we go, okay, so you know this is probably low testosterone. Now you always got to ask the question why, but we go, okay, you got low testosterone. This is your weight. This is your irritability. You lost your motivation. This is your brain fog, cholesterol, blood sugar, high blood pressure, all this kind of stuff. So. Oh, you're low in red blood cell zinc. Well, your gut's off. You can't absorb nutrients. Your ferritin, iron stores are running really high, accumulating your testicles. Well, your gut's off. It got leaky. You can't get rid of toxins from the body because even if you run your detox pathways, drop toxins into your gut to poop in the toilet, because most toxins have to be pooped in the toilet. There's only a few toxins in our body that we can sweat out and pee out and breathe out. Can't get rid of. These toxins, they keep recycling back into the leakiness and accumulating over time. Your body is so stressed out because you're not feeling good. Cortisol's gotten stuck in the stress mode. Those are the reasons you can't make testosterone. So we might supplement with zinc. We fix the leaky gut with that foundational triad, get rid of infections as well with the broad spectrum antimicrobial. We use something from Canada called pH structure silver solution. We start getting rid of the things that are causing physical stress. So that cortisol is in a position to reset from stress to calm. But then we teach you how to teach cortisol what calm feels like. Like uh, uh, Brian, go out and play some golf. But don't stress about it, right? Or just walk in nature, do your deep breathing, your meditation, uh, cortisol resets. And then guys who come in with a total testosterone like you know, 200, 250, 150, supposed to be the closer to 800, they just start making testosterone on their own. Truly, uh, years ago, when it came out, oh, my gosh, how important is testosterone? And if you're low, let's give it to somebody. Oh, my gosh, did they feel better? But I very rarely order testosterone nowadays because you can get guys to start making it. And you do it, and you say, come, let's do some repeat labs in three months. Come back and see me in three and a half months. They've taken a testosterone that's like 187, and they're up to like in, in three months. And then we keep going and kind of fine tune something. Then their 440s up to 600, 650, 700. They're just making testosterone on one room. They're no longer irritable. Their wife loves them again. The brain fog's gone. They're losing weight. Their cholesterol's down. Their blood pressure's great. Their blood pressure is great. Blood sugar's great. And they feel like they're in their 20s again. And we go like, that's how it's supposed to be. Because if the body works well, you stay healthy. And if you're not staying healthy, if you're not feeling good, there's always a really good reason. It is never age. Because as you can imagine, we get people in their 50s coming in. Well, I think I'm just getting old. But we have dudes in their 20s coming in, women in their 20s saying, I think it's just age. I'm like, no, 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 no. Nothing is age related to at least 90. Now, we're learning so much about human longevity that truly the human body is probably designed to be really, really healthy, sharp brain, functional, moving around, doing your stuff, motivation, like 105. But I usually say 90. Nothing is age-related until 90. So if it's something going on with you before 90, it is not age. 
but it is something. And it's something we should be able to figure out and fix. And then it's interesting. What areas of anti-aging have you seen sort of come about over the last, you know, 10, 5, 10, 15 years that have sort of gotten you excited? Yeah. So uh, we used to think that our genes, our DNA was hardwired. Whatever you got, you got good, bad, otherwise. Parents and grandparents, hopefully more good came down than bad because you're looking at them and going, geez, you know, I see some things <laughs> that I don't want. Right. Prostate cancer, breast cancer, because breast and prostate cancer are the same thing, just in different sexes. So, you know, it's pretty well known that if a guy has a history of prostate cancer in his family, he's more likely to get it. Now, you can prevent it, not hard. But if you have women in your family breast cancer, you're much more likely to get prostate cancer because it's the same thing. And it, if a woman has prostate cancer in her family, she's more likely to get breast cancer. So you go, geez, I hope I got the right genes. Well, it turns out it's not what genes you have. It's which ones are turned on and turned off. So this is epigenetics, the things that influence gene expression without changing the genetic code itself. So when people aren't feeling well, it's because they've turned on bad genes and turned off good genes in every cell in the body. So it's so easy to start getting one thing after another because every cell is being told the wrong information by the genes. So it's called gene expression. And so the things that we're talking about here, playing golf and not stressing about it, nature, deep breathing, meditation, fixing vitamin deficiencies, fixing the gut, getting testosterone to come up, it all is because you're turning off the bad, turning on the good. You're optimizing your epigenetics. You fix everything. Optimally, if you can do this before conceiving a child, you then pass on cleaner gene expression to the next six to eight generations. The next six to eight generations will benefit. The corollary is if you don't, you pass it on from your genes to the next six to eight generations. So we're all the product of the previous six to eight generations. So you see what's going on in the previous generations. You're like, okay, they got flipped the wrong way. But that got passed down to me. So everything we do optimizes epigenetics. And by doing that, you fix everything, lock somebody in place, they stay healthy. So on my um, on the free online email course uh, called Medical Bill Detox on my website, it's seven emails that take a deep dive into these central mechanisms that drive chronic disease and what you can do to reverse them yourself. The very first one is epigenetics because this is such an important cool concept, including when they, they map the human genome. They go, okay, we're going to map the human genome. Ten years, no, 12 years, 12 major sites. So we're going to figure out every gene that causes a disease. We'll go zap it, and the disease is over. They get done, they go, oh, well, that's interesting. There are a few super rare diseases, 50 people in the world with a gene. We can zap it. But, but it's not what genes you have. It's which ones get turned on and turned off. It's epigenetics. So this is so cool because we can flip genes. Awesome. Turn off the bad. Yeah. That is amazing. And what would you say some of the big levers that you can do to help with epigenetics? I'm sure... I'm sure we talk about it a lot on this podcast, but what are the ones that you sort of prescribe with your uh, clients? Well, Harvard showed about 16 years ago that things like meditation, deep breathing, those kind of things work through epigenetics. And they go, well, wow, no wonder this thing, written calm, can fix anything and prevent anything. And then this butyrate, part of that foundational triad made by the good bacteria in the gut, it works almost exclusively through epigenetics. So it's good for everything right um there's this thing made by the liver called tudka it's a bile acid it's also called the chaperone mm -hmm. molecule because this it works through epigenetics which is super cool you go wow it can't be any cooler than epigenetics but i gotta say even though you ask what's the biggest thing this tudka mm -hmm. works to an even cooler mechanism i think so we talked about civilization diseases all these things that are so much more common now than they used to be whether it's obesity, diabetes, cancer, autism, cholesterol, hypertension, kidney disease, liver disease, cataracts, retinal issues, gut, autoimmune disease, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, dementia, Lou Gehrig's, all these things. Your body's liver cannot make enough of this Tudka to deal with that inflammation coming from our toxic world, toxic stress, environmental toxins, all these kind of things. Infections are so much more common. So it turns out that because the human body is 80% protein, our cells make new proteins to do work, take the place of beat up proteins. 
So as proteins are being made in our cells, in a part called the endoplasmic reticulum, they become misfolded. And the misfolding of proteins drives all disease, including type 1 diabetes. And type 1 diabetes is so much more common now than it used to be. So this Tadka made by the liver as a chaperone molecule, it chaperones these proteins to the production process. They don't become misfolded. Oh, my gosh, what a central mechanism to stay healthy, but also to reverse chronic health issues. And so this misfolding of proteins even has to do with how we deal with epigenetic problems. So it's almost even a bigger central mechanism because it really turns off and on genes because you have to have proteins, enzymes, and other things, healthy immune cells, healthy proteins in the immune cells, to actually do this kind of work. So this Tudka, uh, capital T, capital U, capital D, capital C, capital A, Taro, Urso, deoxycholic acid, you can see why they abbreviate it, um, <laughs> such a central mechanism uh, because we do not have this problem of misfolding of proteins. Uber central mechanism. Yeah, actually was... I learned about Tutka a little bit, and I, uh, it's a sort of a, it's like a unique bile acid, right? Um, yep. And uh, a, a lot of times, uh, you can supplement with Tutka as well. Yep. Obviously, yep. Um, is this something you look into some, some of your clients for some? Yeah, we use it a lot. There's so much yeah. cool data, including truly, it is going to be one of the major keys in reversing type one diabetes. Because Tudka is so important for the cells in the pancreas that make insulin, to actually make insulin. And it turns out in type 1 diabetes, the cells that make insulin are not destroyed by the immune system like you tend to see in most autoimmune disease. So if you're making antibodies attacking the thyroid, you're destroying the thyroid tissue called Hashimoto's, and you can't make thyroid hormones, you got to be on medication. Or if you're attacking with antibodies the joints, the rheumatoid arthritis, you're destroying the joints. Now, you can reverse it and turn it around, but it turns out, that's not what happens in type 1 diabetes. In type 1 diabetes, because of the inability to get rid of the inflammation, that other part of the immune system, the cells in the pancreas that make insulin go dormant. They just start making insulin. So I go, oh, that's so cool. All we got to do is wake them up. It turns out if you are on an insulin pump, and so many men nowadays are getting type 1 diabetes, you're on an insulin pump 10 years, 20 years. So those cells that make insulin are sitting there just dormant just waiting for someone to wake them up again. And in the vast majority of people, they're just sitting there. They're not destroyed. No, Tudka gets in the wake up. It is, and it's one reason why people get type 1 diabetes in the first place, such as premature infants' livers don't make as much Tudka as term babies' livers. So premature babies are more likely to get this type 1 diabetes. But that early inability to make Tudka there's such a central mechanism, those premature babies, livers can't make quite enough Tudka. They're actually more likely to get type 2 diabetes their entire life. It sets the system in a bad place. Now, not that we can't turn around decades later, but this is sure. where, you know, some really cool interventions for people's children, premature, delivered, kind of a traumatic pregnancy or, or delivery. They get a little jaundice at birth. Jaundice is because of a liver ding, got dinged there. It's like, okay, well, we see what will do this and set your system the wrong way. We're actually in a position to reverse it at within you know, the first few months of your life that will set somebody's system so they don't have to deal with this stuff as they get through their years. Yeah, it's, um, it's pretty remarkable. I mean, I think supplementation market's gotten flooded with things that probably aren't great, but then if you get sort of the right direction and you find things that can really benefit you, it can, it can go a long way. Something like Tutka, like you mentioned. And kind of the things that you're learning about, you know, these big central mechanisms, right? Intestinal microbiome, cortisol, and Tudka. And it's like, and this is where people, you know, you, you go online, you read about stuff, and people may come in to see us on like 50 supplements. And yeah. I look at them, I go, you've done your homework. You've been reading because everyone you're using makes sense. But you're missing the central mechanisms, like the seven central mechanisms we talk about. You're missing these guys. and if you do these guys, you don't need all this other stuff you're taking. And these guys are going to get you where you really need to go. And your website is drdavidbilstrom.com, right? That's easy. Your name. Dr. David Bilstrom. And I'll ask you, because uh, we're getting up on it, but I'll ask you one question that I normally ask most of my guests. What one tip would you give an individual that 
you know, maybe, you know, 40, 50, 60 years old that looking to get their body and mind back to what it once was, what one sort of tip would you give that individual? I'd say uh, look at your central mechanisms because it doesn't take much if you hit the central mechanisms because then with the body's inherent tendency to always move towards wellness, it has always been sitting there waiting to get better. It knows how to get you better. Something's gotten in the way. And then when you figure out the central mechanisms and get them out of the way, the body says, hot dog, I can fix this. And no matter how long you've had something, your body's still waiting. You can have something for 50 years. It's waiting. It's waiting. You get it out of the way. The body goes, I can fix that. You fix new stuff. You fix old stuff. And then hopefully you sit there going, oh, my gosh, my body is amazing. I can't believe <laughs> it could fix this. I just had to get this stuff out of the way. Yeah. The body will heal itself as long as you just sort of put it in the right direction, right? And if it's not healing itself, you know there's got to be a reason, a very specific reason, because that's how it works. It fixes things. Well, this is great, Dr. Bilstrom. Uh, I'll put a link for your website uh, in the show notes. Uh, you're also, uh, your clinic is out in Idaho, right? Correct. So we do telehealth. Thus, we see people from 21 time zones around the world. Excellent. Love it. Uh, well, I appreciate you coming on the podcast and, and sharing all this knowledge with us. Oh, Brian, thank you so much for having me. And we didn't get a chance to talk about golf. <laughs> we could do that offline. Okay. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, I could do a whole hour on golf. But we were going to we'll talk about athletic that. performance. Crud. Uh, <laughs> well, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I understand there are millions of other podcasts out there and you've chosen to listen to mine and I appreciate that. Check out the show notes at briangrin.com for everything that was mentioned in this episode. Feel free to subscribe to the podcast and share it with a friend or family member that's looking to get their body back to what it once was. Thanks again and have a great day.